What I'm going to do is just to spend the next 15 minutes hopefully convincing you that there's an area of healthcare that we, we that's absolutely essential for uh, the future delivery of healthcare services, but we actually neglect in most discussions around, uh, around healthcare innovation. And that's the question of the built environment, the built infrastructure for delivering healthcare. And um, um, there's the title, Innovation, Technology and the Built Infrastructure. It's all connected, uh, but we spend most of our time thinking about new drugs, new devices, um, uh, you know, the, the Fitbit that I'm wearing, the mobile phone, the, the new physical technologies that uh, we associate with innovation. And some of us might think about organizational change and new service delivery models and business models and so on. Uh, but we tend to neglect the built infrastructure. And of course, healthcare isn't de delivered in a, in, in a vacuum. It's delivered from buildings, from our homes, from our offices. Um, and and uh, it's a, an essential part of the future of healthcare. So that's, that's the task for the next 15 minutes. Uh, convince you that this is, this is an important but neglected area. Just a couple of slides just to kick things off, just to get everybody up to speed on the magnitude of the global health challenge. Um, we spend something like seven to eight trillion dollars a year on, on healthcare globally, and around two trillion dollars on the inputs. Uh, so that's the drugs, the, 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 the medical technology, the drugs, the, the devices, uh, the IT. But we also spend something like four or five hundred billion dollars a year around the world on new buildings for infrastructure, and that's the, the little purple bit in the uh, roundel up there. And um, it's, it's you know that we should be spending more actually, but it's it's not an inconsiderable sum. It's about the same as we spend on uh, on, on on medical devices. So it's it's a big area of healthcare. Um, so I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, the other thing I just want to say is a couple of words about the magnitude of the global health challenges. And uh, ageing, we all know, is, is, is a huge, huge issue, uh, not just in the developed countries now, but also in, in, in many parts of uh, the developing world, the emerging markets, uh, China in particular, uh, India. Um, and of course, associated with that, there are uh, a whole set of um, health conditions that, uh, that that need to be addressed. Just to re reprise Calgary's points, um, we have a, hu a huge problem around uh, um, our changing lifestyles and the changing kinds of uh, medical condition associated with that. Um, we've moved from a situation where 100 years ago, food was expensive compared to our incomes and exercise was cheap. We all did manual work, we walked everywhere. And of course, it's completely the reverse now. Food is cheap for most of us in many, many countries of the world, and exercise is expensive. We, we, we have to make a conscious effort to take exercise, whether it means joining a gym or just actively going out and uh, spending time during the day exercising. So of course, we have the, 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 the diseases associated with that shift beginning to really take hold now. And as Calgary said, um, was it 1.9 billion people um, are overweight in the world at the moment and 650 million are actually obese. So a major problem. Um, and that is manifesting itself within the health systems of the, of, the, of the world. Just to take the UK, the gap between what we spend on healthcare or what we're likely to be spending on healthcare in the next five, six, seven years and what is estimated we might need to be spending to give everybody the care they really need is growing larger and larger. And it's anything from, and these are, these are annual figures, anything from £20 billion pounds a year to £60 billion pounds a year. So major, major problems in actually paying for the services that, that we need to provide for this new aging, obese, uh, diabetic society. Um, of course, not all the world is like the UK or like the USA. Um, and in large parts of the world, particularly South Asia and Africa, there are still major problems around access to healthcare, access to decent services, shortages of, work, work, of healthcare workers, shortages of infrastructure for healthcare. So that's the magnitude of the, 
of the challenge. That, that's that's what global health systems need to deal with in the next 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years. And innovation is certainly part of that story. You know, we, we need to do things differently. We need to be innovative. We need to deliver new care in new types of, uh, in, in new ways. And as I said at the beginning, when we think about innovation in healthcare, we tend to think of the technology. You know, we think of the science, the drugs, the devices, the robotic surgery, the Fitbits, and all the rest of it. And that's fine, you know, but I, I want to have the best possible care delivered by you know, the most up-to-date uh, technology um, if, 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 if I'm ill. But actually, as part of the solution to meeting those, those, those challenges I've just outlined, the science and technology is only a tiny, tiny part of it. This is from a recent report by the Health Foundation, and um, it, it, it breaks down the, 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 the healthcare challenge in the UK over the next 10 years um, into various different uh, categories of solution. And the top one there in green is the science and technology. Most of it is about changing behavior. It's about intervening earlier. It's about prevention. It's about developing new models of healthcare, new ways of delivering services. It's about managing cost and managing need for healthcare. Uh, more effectively. So the science and technology is important, but it's, it's it's only part of the story. Over the last 10 years, 15 years, there's been a lot of talk about disruptive innovation. Uh, certainly in many industries, many sectors, banking, finance included, but also in, 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 in healthcare as well. And um, this goes back to Clayton Christensen's points um, about uh, 15 years ago um, around the need for solutions that are really cheaper, simpler, but good enough. His argument was that we deliver healthcare from expensive buildings, using expensive people and expensive technologies, and we need to move towards models where the solutions are simpler, cheaper, but they do the job. So, you know, if we leave the scientists to it, we'll end up with a Swiss Army penknife like that. And I said that, in, I just showed this slide in Switzerland once, and somebody actually said, but I'd, I'd really like a Swiss Army penknife like that. Um, but uh, but it, it's not what we need. So I'll come back to all that in a moment, back to disruptive innovation in a moment. The question is, where does the infrastructure fit into all this? Are we spending that half a trillion dollars a year wisely? Are we creating buildings that are fit for purpose in the next 10, 20 years in, in, in it, for delivering healthcare? And I think we need to look at this from two different perspectives, from the perspective of developed countries and developing health systems. And uh, in the developing world, uh, nobody is saying we don't need new hospitals. Um, India needs to build something like six to 700,000 new hospital bed spaces in the next seven or eight years to cope with demand. Um, but what we're in danger of doing is replicating the outdated old models of healthcare infrastructure, hospital design uh, in developing countries uh, that we've, we're trying to get away from desperately here and, and, in, and elsewhere in Europe and so on. Uh, nobody needs 3,800 bed hospitals like that one in the picture below. It's going to be a white elephant in 10, 15 years' time. Um, and happily in Certainly in, in some countries in the, uh, emerging, with emerging health systems, we're beginning to see a shift. We're beginning to see new technology and new business models being leveraged to really make a change in the kind of models for delivering healthcare. Um, and that's partly using mobile phones, but it's also using really, really exciting diagnostic technology, point-of-care testing, um, where you can, you can test for... 10, 15 conditions using, you know, a, 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 a device that is that can be that, that you can use in the home or people can use in a village, uh, and they don't have to travel to a hospital to to get that test and then travel again to get the result. Uh, so there's a really huge amount of action around diagnostic uh, testing, and um, and that's beginning to shift 
the way in which healthcare is delivered in some of these countries, beginning to shift thinking so that the argument is we, 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 can, we can shift the expertise from doctors to individuals and, and cheaper health workers, and we can do it out in the community. Um, and there's also disruptive innovation in the design of hospitals and, and, and other healthcare buildings. Um, NH hospitals in India uh, have driven down the cost of new heart hospitals from typically $60 million to $6 million uh, by stripping out all the extraneous, um, unnecessary frippery that you get around hospitals and bringing it back to basics and building technologically enabled business models around that hospital so that you can reach out to people in villages using telemedicine, telehealth, uh, and and uh, you've got novel forms of um, insurance f uh, for, for funding people's care as well. So there's a whole ecosystem building up around those those new hospital models. So I think there's a lot of interesting things going on in uh, in India and and some other countries with emerging healthcare systems. Um, it's slightly different in uh, in the UK and, uh, and and other developed countries because, of course, we've got a legacy of institutions. Uh, we've got a legacy of infrastructure which has been built up over the last 100, 150, 200 years. And what we've got in the UK at the moment is a fault line emerging around the traditional inpatient district general hospital model. And ironically, of course, we've just spent... £20 billion in the last 10, 15 years, building 100 new district general hospitals as well. Um, but the fault line is beginning to tear that model apart. And increasingly, services are being shifted into the community um, and into our homes using technologies like telehealth, re remote monitoring, and rethinking what primary care means uh, and thinking about how we intervene earlier to keep people out of hospitals. Um, and on the other end of that uh, that spectrum, um, increasingly we're seeing the concentration of specialist services in in, in the, the leading tertiary hospitals, the, 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 the main university hospitals. And again, if if I have a serious problem, I want to be treated in the best possible hospital with the best possible technology and doctors, not necessarily my local district general hospital in in, in Brighton. So we've got that legacy, we've, we've got those trends, and really it's all about managing that, 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 that process uh, rather than building new infrastructure. Um, and all the opportunities, I think, are really on the right-hand side of that, of that spectrum. It's about rethinking the infrastructure for primary care. Um, what does that look like? What do we mean by primary care? It's about rethinking the role of the home. We're all ageing. Um, most people want to, if we're ill, we don't want to really go into a hospital if we can help it. Um, we always get better faster when we're at home. Um, but are the homes of people fit for purpose? Um, and it's about connectivity. It's about ensuring that you have in place the telehealth, telecare systems, which are able to mon monitor at-risk elderly people, for example, um, or provide the support to people who are, have just been diagnosed with diabetes, um, in a way that means that both their behaviour is, is changed and, and, and that, that behaviour change is reinforced um, and they're given indications of their, of their lifestyle and how that's affecting their behaviour. And, um, and doctors can intervene earlier if, if they see a problem emerging. So it's about creating that connected health ecosystem out in the community. Um, and... Really, just to, to, to conclude, to, uh, I've just got three takeaways for you, really. Um, as I said, we spend something like half a trillion dollars a year building new healthcare infrastructure uh, to, support, to support healthcare. Um, I would suggest that not only is that not enough, because we do need to spend more. I mean, 70,000 beds were built in Africa in the last 15 years, I think, which is way too little. Um, but our definition of what we mean by healthcare infrastructure needs to evolve. It's got to shift towards smaller, cheaper, simpler, um, flexible, functionally efficient, functionally useful, but, but, but delivered in an affordable way. Uh, models of, of, 
of um, infrastructure and not just buildings that try and accommodate the, the, the onslaught from obesity, from ageing, from diabetes, just by building bigger and bigger hospitals. So change the definition. Secondly, uh, we need to leverage the power of investors, banks, pension funds, vast amounts of money sloshing around in the world. We all need health care. Um, we, 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 you know, we need to match those pension fund investments with, with you know, demands with investments that, 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 that are going to give a return. And healthcare is not going to go away. It's a huge industry. Um, but we, we need to make sure the dialogue is, is, is the right dialogue um, in terms of uh, future models of healthcare. Um, and then finally, I mentioned uh, inertia. Um, there's huge political and institutional inertia um, within the health system. And um, uh, you know, whatever you think about junior doctors, and uh, um, you can just see that whenever you try and change something in healthcare, you immediately get a political backlash. Uh, so um, how do we deal with that political and institutional inertia to put in place those new models of healthcare which are going to be sustainable in the future? Thank you.